This is the Influencer Entrepreneurs Podcast with Jenny Melrose, where I strategize with business owners on how to grow and scale their businesses to hit their income goals. This is episode 244 of the Influencer Entrepreneurs Podcast with Jenny Melrose. Today, I am talking with Tanessa Shears, and we're diving into how to get rid of brain fog for more productivity. And then the things that we're going to be talking about are really using biohacking, which I had to ask the question exactly what that meant, because of course, I've been thinking, okay, she's going to tell me to use some sort of IVs and do all these fancy kind of stuff that we need to do, but that's not it. It's just little strategies to help you be more productive. And it's related to your body. So getting better sleep, feeling more a week and on point when you are trying to sit down to get some work done. So you're going to want to make sure that you listen into this episode. As always, you can DM me at Jenny underscore Melrose to be able to get the opt-in that she's talking about in the episode, which are going to be 12 biohacks for more energy. All right, you guys, let's dive in. Hi, Tanessa. How are you? Welcome to the podcast. I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on. I am so excited to dive into this conversation. I really love the idea of getting rid of brain fog um, just because I think it's gotten so much worse with what we've dealt with over the past year with COVID. But before we jump into that, will you introduce yourself to my audience as well as your business? Yeah. So my name is Tanessa Shears. I'm a health consultant and I work specifically with entrepreneurs because I find as we grow our businesses and we start reaching that point where we're like, oh, I've got some traction. This is exciting. What we usually notice is that one of the first things that gets bumped off the plate as we, you know, take on more clients or more customers, or we know we're getting more involved is our health. And we don't mean it to happen, but it does. And what ends up happening is our work starts to expand as our business grows. And we start, you know, the business begins to roll over a bit into personal time. And then all of a sudden, you know, we're pulling some late nights or our sleep gets compromised and then we're tired the next day. So then we're choosing food that's out of convenience. And what is happening is we are creating this like snowball effect of inflammation. And what that's doing is it's causing us to be so much less productive in the time we're actually spending at work. So not only now is it spilling over into personal time, but we can't stop thinking about our business because we're always like, I didn't get this done. I didn't get that done. And we just create the sense of brain fog, which is, you know, it's reducing the quality of our work, but it's slowing it down and really hacking into that lifestyle, which is, I mean, that's why we're creating our side hustles and our businesses, right? So that we can have the lifestyle that we want, but if we can't enjoy it, what's the point? So that's what I do. I work one-on-one with entrepreneurs to really help them almost create like their own set of standard operating procedures for like, this is how I get my brain to work. This is what I need to be doing to be, you know, firing at 90% of my peak capacity. And then we just kind of create that as like a guideline for them. Like, Hey, if you want to feel this way, these are the steps that get you there. Yes. And I can so definitely understand the brain fog. Um, I can remember it back when I was just had the lifestyle site, the Maros family. It was to a point where I went to the doctor thinking that I was having Alzheimer's because I couldn't remember what I had just said or what I had just done and slowly started to realize, wait a second, this isn't anything that's going on with me. It's more, Adam not letting it shut off, just like you talked about. So can you define what is brain fog? So when we're talking about that, what exactly would be some of maybe the symptoms, things that you would kind of notice? Yeah. So the interesting thing is like brain fog is one of those terms that you wouldn't go into your doctor's office and they would be like, oh, you've just got brain fog. What brain fog is, is actually a collection of symptoms instead. And like you said, it's forgetfulness. Like for me, it used to show up as like, I'd sit down to write an email and I can't remember who the heck I was supposed to write the email to. And I'm just like, what is the name? What is the name? What is the name? It's things like that. But it's also looking at things like just that low energy and just that general fatigue. That's not normal tired. It's kind of the fatigue you wake up with and you never quite shake out of it. Or, you know, you're getting those rises and falls of energy throughout the day. And then when you actually sit down to do work, your brain feels almost 
clunky and heavy. I don't know if you know that feeling where it just feels like everything feels forced. You don't feel inspired. You don't feel creative. You kind of just feel really down. And then on top of that, you're easily distracted. You've like lost our ability to stay focused on one thing. You're literally going from maybe Facebook to Instagram to my email back to what I was doing. Oh, but I got an Amazon tab open. And then we look at our desktop. We've got 30 tabs open and we're kind of in all of them. And we just can't get any quality deep work done. So we end up taking three, four times as long to do the same task because we can't stay focused and our brain is not working. It's always run. Think about this. Like your brain is meant to do wonderful things. It's one of the most amazing like creations and computers on the planet with what it can do. But we, we treat it in such a way as which we're just okay with it barely functioning, meaning we just do the basic things we get up and get through the day. So I always like, what would it be like if your thinking was sharp and clear and focused and you could get done in your workday what you intended to get done? Yes. Oh my goodness. Yes. And I think it's interesting to me because some of the symptoms that you kind of, the way you described it, it almost sounds a little like how you would feel if you thought you were having depression because you're feeling that kind of like down. And I think with COVID, it kind of added to everything else. There was so much emotional peace that went into it. So I find it really interesting that those are some of the symptoms too, that are kind of popping in because mental health is something that we do need to be talking about and putting some action behind. So how can we get rid of brain fog and become more productive? So I think it comes down to identifying like what is causing all our brain fog in the first place. And brain fog is associated with the amount of inflammation that is going on in your body. So when we hear inflammation, we think things like, oh, like a sprained ankle, right? Like it's red and it's swollen. It's got all this fluid. That happens in your digestive tract. It happens in your vascular system, your blood vessels, and it happens in your brain. So if this is going on in our body, it really slows down our ability to think and it allows our our prefrontal cortex. That's the part of our brain that, you know, is responsible for doing all our planning and thinking and what makes us entrepreneurs. It takes it offline. So all of a sudden we're kind of reacting to things. We're panicked. We're overwhelmed. We have all these emotions that are coming up all of the time. So what we start looking at is, what is causing all of this inflammation that's coming into our bodies? And there are three primary ways. I mean, there's a lot of others, but three that I, when I talk to entrepreneurs, this is what they are. It is lack of a quality sleep, not long enough, but lack of a quality sleep. It is putting food in our mouth that is out of convenience and taste rather than what it's actually doing in our bodies. And then the last one is subjecting our body to chronic stress. Even if it doesn't feel like we're stressed out in our brain, our bodies can perceive stress. So those are the three ways that inflammation tends to affect brain fog the most. Okay. So what are some examples? How can we like, I know you talk a lot about biohacking. Can you actually start by defining that? Because I, of course, went through and was looking at your website and was so excited because I just think that we often think that we can just put in like simple systems and we're not taking care of our health and our bodies. So the fact that you kind of focus on that was exciting to me. So will you talk a little bit about biohacking? Yeah. When I first heard the word biohacking, I was like, this is illegal. This doesn't sound safe. Like it sounds intimidating. I don't even know if I like that word. That was my first reaction to that word. But once I learned what it was, I was like, okay, this is cool. So if you're thinking the word biohacking, what is it? Think health optimization as a synonym for it. So what I always like to think of is biohacking specifically is making intentional changes to not only your external environment, but your internal environment to create a sense of longevity, well-being, create energy, all of those things we associate with just feeling really good in our bodies and living a long, healthy life, right? So the way I apply biohacking specifically is that I'm all about ROI, return on investment. As entrepreneurs, we don't have tons of extra time to take on 30 new health habits and just hope for the best, right? So I am always thinking like this, like when we say, for example, go and run like a Facebook ad, you want to be split testing, right? You test, you know, image A and image B and see what works. I do biohacking the same way. So I track all of the data of my clients. And for me personally, I track it either on a Fitbit or an Oura Ring. These are things that track everything from heart rate to how stressed your body is, to your sleep metrics, to your breathing rate, all of that kind of stuff. So what I always love to do is when I implement a new health habit, 
I am like, okay, did I see a positive impact on my sleep? So for example, if I remove blue light, do I have more deep sleep? I'm always constantly checking because I don't ever want to spend my time doing something that I don't get more energy out of than I put into. We just don't have time for that. So that's kind of where I see biohacking and entrepreneurship go so wonderfully together is because innately we understand the idea of testing and editing and failing and seeing what works and what doesn't and not just blanket applying all of these things that we hear online. It's about what's working, what's not, and what do we have to do differently so that it ends up personalized. All our businesses are different as our bodies and we can't just expect, you know, all the generic health advice to apply to us. So we want to find a way of measuring it. And so that's where I find biohacking is kind of that neat thing of like, here's what I'm going to implement specifically for this reason. Did I get the result I wanted? Okay. So you gave the example of blue light and helping with sleep. Could you give another example? Because that's my audience loves examples. I'm very much a teacher and feel like if we can give more examples, the better off we're going to be. Um, And you mentioned the Fitbit, which I love being able to actually track the heart rate and using that data. But could you give another example? It doesn't have to be sleep related at anything. Yeah, honestly, though, like if I'm going to say start somewhere, it's going to be sleep. So one of the one of the things that is really actionable that we can do is understanding the difference between sleep duration and sleep opportunity. So before I got my Fitbit trackers and all of this kind of thing, I always used to think I was a great sleeper. I used to think, oh, it's great. I go to sleep at 11 and wake up at seven. That's eight hours, right? But what I didn't understand is that the amount of time that your brain spends asleep is different than what we think because our brains are naturally waking up during the night. We take time to fall asleep. So on average, when I look with entrepreneurs, we're only seeing you know an hour to an hour, 15 minutes awake per night. So if you only are in bed for eight hours, you're really now in that category of sleep deprivation of getting six hours, 45 to seven hours a night. So one of the easiest things that you can do is tried and true advice. It's go to bed and wake up at the same time, give or take half an hour every single day, even on weekends. Because while we sleep, something called our circadian rhythm is at play. And it basically is a really fancy word for the idea that we follow a clock, our hormones, our body temperature, our sleep cycles. So the more consistent we can be with that, the more we can optimize our hormones. And a good example of that is the hormone melatonin, which helps us fall asleep at night. That hormone should start ramping up two to three hours before bed so that we fall asleep, stay asleep, and have good quality sleep. Because there's a difference between just a long sleep and a good quality sleep. But if you're constantly changing the time at which you're going to bed, then that hormone is going to be negatively affected. So then we're going to have interrupted sleep, which just leaves us feeling like this sense of it's called sleep inertia the next morning, that kind of like I got hit by a truck feeling. So that's another good one is to be super consistent with your circadian rhythm. Okay. Um, And I know that some of my toddler and newborn moms are listening going, "Mm mm-hmm, that would be wonderful (laughs) if I could get the baby to do that first, of course. Are there any things that for them, for the ones that have little ones that are still getting up, I went through that phase probably till my youngest was five, where it was every night she was climbing into bed, she was waking us up about something. What do you do in those cases? So I have a 15 month old. I am in that and I can tell you exactly what we did. So we actually biohacked my daughter's sleep intentionally. And we started putting ideas for this into place before she was even here. So if you think about children, they're just really little versions of us, right? So we need to think what makes sleep good for us is good for them. So things that we do with my daughter are things we do for us. A very good example is getting blackout curtains. I don't mean curtains that, you know, you can close and then light still comes through. I mean, like I do something called the hand test with my clients. So if you're listening right now, you can do this at home. If you hold your hand up six inches in front of your face, right when you go to sleep and right when you wake up, if you can see your hand, it is too bright in your room. So we did something really simple. We just went on Amazon, got some double-sided stick Velcro and Velcroed the edge of the curtains to the wall so that we're not getting that light, especially if you sleep with your windows open in the summer, a big breeze comes in and all that light, that'll actually disrupt middle of the night melatonin. So that was one of the first things we did. We have our regular blinds, we have blackout blinds, everything's Velcroed to the wall and sealed. And then the second thing we did was we, we optimized her circadian rhythm, which means 
we work well on a schedule, so do babies. So being as consistent as possible. And then the other thing we did, we know that the sounds that go on during the night, our body hears them, even though we're not processing them. So one thing that we did literally from like in the hospital day was we had a sound machine on. And it's something that neutralizes that soundscape. And I mean, I could go on. There are so many things that work for us, like things like getting out in nature, like, you know, spending time under the trees has done wonderful things. Getting sunlight on your skin really helps to reset your circadian rhythm. Um, Watching that you're not eating really big meals right before bed, like all of the things we intuitively know, if we replicate those as best we can with our kids, then they'll feel optimized too. So, I mean, we've also had really good luck with our daughter being a wonderful sleeper. She has slept through the night a long time, but I mean, I'm I'm, I'm assuming that part of that is just how, how much we guarded her body's, I guess you could call it health and how strict we were with that just to kind of really set her up on the best foot we can. Yes. Those are great examples. And I think the routine is something that as a parent, as an adult, um, it has definitely helped me. And I always put it back to being a former teacher. I was so used to a schedule and just a consistent routine, but it definitely, they thrive in it. Kids just do. Mm-hmm. They know the expectations and what to, especially as they get older, which is a whole nother ball game, but we won't go there. I had to get mine a phone. Uh, she just got out of fifth grade and we had said middle school. So it's like that turning of, oh my God, we've got a middle schooler. How did that happen? But so one of the biggest struggles that I see my listeners having is with overwhelm. What are some strategies that we can put in place specifically for overwhelm? So they'll get to a point where they feel like they have to do this on social media and they got to create all this content and they're trying to do homeschooling or they're trying to you know get dinner on the table. And it's just this spiral of overwhelm. Yeah. One of the things that I had a business coach help me with specifically that I also now replicate with my clients is the idea of going through all the things you tell yourself you should be doing and ask, does this make me money? Because I, I mean, we all get caught up in that. Even if we do this regularly, I do this regularly and I still did this about a month ago and hacked a whole bunch of stuff off of my list. And I'm like, what is actually serving my audience serving my clients and moving my business forward. And it wasn't all the extra time that I was spending on Instagram necessarily. I was like, oh, well, I've noticed I'm getting so much of a return on my time and value for my audience with my podcast. So like looking through stuff like that, but beyond to answer your question of overwhelm is once you've identified what you actually need to do, not what you think you should be doing, but what needs to be done to move the business forward, it's setting boundaries. And that comes in two forms. Boundaries, number one, is your work hours, setting work hours and honoring them and knowing that that's what you have to work with and sacrificing your health and your sleep and skipping meals is just not going to help that. And the second way we set boundaries is in our mind. It is so easy for us to be sitting at the dinner table off in another world, thinking about the emails we have to respond to. And that's affecting our families. And that's just something that I made a decision on is not something I tolerate with myself anymore. And I made very firm boundaries in my mind that there are containers in which I can think about my business. And I make sure to keep them in those containers. And I often have conversations with myself when I notice myself going there where I will just literally treat my brain like it is a child. And I will be like, Tanessa, this is not time to think about work. You are with your family. And I will have to remind myself like that, but I don't let myself get into thinking about work when I'm with my family because I want that separation. And I think that's what entrepreneurs lose is they lose that separation and it all kinds of blurs together. And because you have no contrast, you feel like you're always in it. And then you get that fight and flight adrenaline and it just creates overwhelm, right? More inflammation, less sleep, poor meals, skip your workouts because you have to get more done. And then you have brain fog and you don't get enough done. It's really this cycle. And we don't realize that it is something we must break. Okay. So here's the pushback. I know that the listeners are thinking is that they only have pockets of time where they actually don't have kids on them or kids with them or where they can actually get stuff done. So to try to put boundaries in where they can't be on their phone answering an email um, during car ride or pickup or um, once the kids are in bed and they're just sitting watching their TV, the television, like with their husband, um, that's the fight that they're going to get. I know that because I I've used to do it myself and I have plenty of clients that still try to do it. Um, what would you say to them? 
but maybe that can be included in your boundary. Like I've worked with, with entrepreneurs before that are like, you know what, when my kids are playing, they're of the age where they're okay. I don't need to be watching them every way. And if you are working while you're with family, that's fine. But that's a decision that you make on purpose, not something that spills over because you are not firm with your own boundaries. Like, I don't think there's, I've done that as well. Like my daughter is sitting there on the floor. I'm like literally sitting beside her. And if I have to answer a couple emails, that's, that's a, something I've allowed for during that time but I'm not going to allow that to creep in on time that I don't intend for that. Does that make sense? And then I think it comes with once you make those decisions, honor them and choosing not to go down the guilt road with it, because that's optional. Like if we just decide and honor that it creates so much space, you know what I mean? But I also think there's watching our brains because our brains really like to kind of kick up. Oh, but just this, just this, just this. Right. And I find that if you're feeling that consistent overwhelm, it may be that you need more defined boundaries. It doesn't mean boundaries as in like, you don't ever work with family. It's just, maybe you need to put some more parameters in there. Right. Like, and I know what you mean about the schedule restriction right now. My work hours are from 6 a.m. to 8.30. That is when my daughter is sleeping. She sleeps again from one to three. I have those containers. My mom watches my daughter one day a week. My husband watches her the other. And that is all I have to run my business. And I'm seeing 15, 16 clients and running my full business in that time because it is a container. I have to have a clear brain so I can go to work, so I can use that time intentionally so it's not spilling over unintentionally. Yes, that makes so much sense. And you also mentioned too, I love that you gave the examples about the business where I also see clients making decisions about, I wouldn't say the word mistake, but decisions. It's about being that people pleaser where, and I used to do this as well, where I felt like I had to be the class mom because I didn't work. I wasn't a teacher anymore. So this is why I I had stopped teaching was so that I could do all the things that my kids needed, or I got to plan the party, or I need to be the one that's doing drop off or whatever it might be. So I think also putting boundaries in there. And like you said, deciding what truly is bringing me. Also, I think joy, like if you really don't enjoy bringing the kids to drop off and you're the one doing the carpool, why are you bothering to do it? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 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 I totally hear you on that. It's about deciding who you want to show up as and being totally okay with it. Like there's no rules about being a, what a good parent looks like. It's interesting. My, my business coach said something that was such a moment for me. She said, I just am not the mom that likes being down on the floor and playing with toys. I will read a book. I will, you know, watch a show, but I was like, Oh my gosh. And that's something that, you know, we create all these rules for ourselves. Like then we create a lot of guilt when we don't follow them, but they weren't our rules in the first place. So whatever that ends up being, what kind of parent we want to show up as that's our decision. But I always say like your reasons for it and then don't choose the guilt. I mean, I'm all about having my own back. Whatever decision I'm going to make about how I show up, that is my choice. And I get to like that. So tell us about your 12 ways to biohack your energy playbook. What will my audience walk away with from it? Yeah, you know, it was interesting because I always, biohacking is one of those things that when we find it, we're like, ooh, this is interesting. I want to know, how can I try this? Like, what are some action strategies? So I looked, I stood back and I looked at my client base and I was like, what are the 12 biohacks that I am doing with them that are getting them the most results. I pulled them out and I put them in this playbook. So the whole point is, is not to go in and apply all of them. It's to be like, Oh, that's cool. Let me start doing that and see how I feel. Great. I liked that. Let's add this one over here. And it touches on everything from movement to standing desks, to how to get into flow faster, to how to eat. And they're basically my 12 favorite biohacks, which I found boost energy the most so that I can wake up, feet on the floor, ready to go and have really productive days. So that is something that has been such a resource and a collection of like, if you're going to go to the best of the best for biohacks, those are the fastest ones that are going to be the most fun and create the most results. All right. Excellent. We're going to link to that in the show notes. I also always tell my listeners that they can always DM me on Instagram to be able to get any of the opt-ins from guests. So my Instagram is at Jenny underscore Mellers. Well, Tanessa, do you have an Instagram account so they could also DM you? I know that they may have some questions left over from this episode and they may want to talk directly to you. Yeah. So my Instagram is just at Tanessa Shears. It's my name. 
but a really good place. And I'm always open to answering questions. I love questions. So I'm just like you, but a really good place as well. I have a podcast called Becoming Limitless and I take deep dives into one little area on each podcast so that if you're just like, say you get the guide and you're just like, that was cool. Tell me more. There's probably a podcast episode on it. <laughs> okay. Excellent. We are going to make sure to link to that in the show notes as well. Any other places that are good spots to connect with you? Honestly, it's Instagram and it is my podcast. I constrain down to the things that I love spending my time on. Right. Exactly. Yeah. No, nope, I'm the same exact way. So Nessa, I appreciate you so much for taking the time to speak with me and my audience. And I'm excited to get your playbook so I can put some of those biohacks in place myself. Awesome. I am so excited. Thank you so much for having me on. All right. Well, there you have it. I hope that you make sure to send Tanessa a DM asking for that link or you, of course, you could always go over to the show notes. One of the things that I personally have put out is a mastering overwhelm guide that I think really is going to connect very well with this episode. So I want to make sure that you also make sure to grab that mastering overwhelm guide. You can send me a DM on Instagram at Jenny underscore Melrose, and I will send it directly to you. Just tell me mastering overwhelm guide and I will make sure that it is sent to you via your DMs. As always, you guys, I appreciate y'all so much when you leave a rating or review on your favorite podcasting app. It helps to find great guests like Tanessa. It just makes it so much easier to be able to get them to come onto the show when they see the reviews that you all are leaving. All right, you guys, until next time, I will see you all then. 